and we're gonna jump right into the next part of the summer school which is our amazing uh panel so i'm gonna pause here okay so i'm just gonna start uh i'm very very excited to have this amazing panel uh where i hope to discuss two things not just the research of the individual panelists but also factors that i think affect not just science of science but science in general related to to demographic to social socioeconomical factors and things like that and in light of, of course in in the of, of the presentations from the previous um uh, presenters so let me introduce the panel uh relatively quickly i'm just going to be the mod moderator here not going to say anything um uh, just try to to moderate the discussion uh so first we have sarah Bar bratt uh, she is a recently uh uh, hire assistant professor in the School of Information at the University of Arizona. She works uh, in, she holds a bachelor in science in philosophy from Ithaca College and a master in science in library and information science with a data science certificate from Syracuse University, where she also got her PhD. Her research lies at the intersection of scholarly communication, research, uh, research data management, and science of science. The overreaching goal of her research is to understand and design for long-term research data sustainability and actual uh, science policy. Then we have Caroline Stein. She is an recently hired, can I say that, assistant professor in the uh, in, at UC uh, Berkeley. Uh, her, uh, her research focuses on the economics of science and innovation, and she's interested in how incentives that scientists face shape the production of knowledge. Uh, she also has a joint appointment with the Haas School of Business and the Department of Economics. Next, we have Jimes Kortmas. She is a senior research scientist at Core Rich Initiative. Uh, she is a PhD level economist with more than 10 years of experience using data science and conducting social, behavioral, and policy research in partnership with local, state, and federal government stakeholders and industry sponsors to solve real world problems. She is a senior scientist, as I said, in the Courage Initiative, but she uh, previously worked as, as an associate professor at the University of Virginia by a Complexity Institute. Next, we have Xiao Chun um, Ni. She is an assistant professor in the Information School at, in the uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. She runs the Meta Science Research Lab, and her research aims at identifying variables that impede and facilitate the creation of a competitive scientific workforce in order to provide implications for science policy decision making. She is currently working on projects related to gender inequalities in science. So, with the order in which I present, I would like to invite uh, Sarah, then Caroline, then Jimes, and then Xiao Chun to give a little introduction to the research, share the screen if they want. And then I'm gonna ask some uh, questions to get started on the discussion. And then later on, I'm gonna switch to this idea of see how gender and race might be affecting not just science of science, but science in general. So Sarah, please go ahead. Hi everyone. Oh my gosh, that was an amazing introduction. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, yeah, it's great to see everyone here. I have a little bit of an overview of some of the findings from um, some of the science of science research we've done, but also intersecting with scholarly communication. So um, it does have some cacti in there, so maybe that'll be entertaining for folks. Hopefully it won't be um, excessively, uh, <laughs> excessively uh, long, but I just wanted to give a little overview. Um, and the big takeaway uh, apart from the, the cacti, um, which we have in great abundance in Arizona, um, is a, a focus on what you what we've covered um, in some of the earlier talks as well is kind of uh, using different sorts of data sources, um, asking new questions to reveal uh, the layers of science that sometimes we're not able to access with our traditional or conventional methods. So, um, a great deal of my research has looked at the invisible labor in science. Also, could I get a little thumbs up that you can see things? Can we see things? Sweet. Okay, great. Um, and so this is right now I've been looking at some of the, the costs as well as the collaboration dynamics of data sets. And so the thing that I use my Thor hammer on um, for <laughs> um, beating home a point is often looking at not just publication metadata to do science of science, but also some non-traditional products of science, such as data sets. And so, um, well, there's a cactus. Before I begin, I do want to also, in a feminist data science tradition, want to acknowledge uh, the place where I am. 
which is the traditional homes of the Tohono O'odham and Yaqui indigenous peoples. And that's the ancestral lands on where the University of Arizona now stands. And so science of science is of course very embodied. We are humans, we need coffee. Um, so I want to acknowledge this land uh, that I am currently on as well. Um, so a great deal of my research has also been looking at issues in data management. And it all comes down to what we see in COVID-19, which was, if you can see, the acceleration of research uh, in vaccine development. If you take a look at this typhoid fever, meningitis, whooping cough, all of these took years to develop a vaccine. But if you look down in the corner, yeah, a little bit here, 2020 took about a year to develop a vaccine. Now, this acceleration, of course, was because of the heroes of science, but there's also a lot that goes on behind the scenes, right? So this is built on a foundation of data production, data set generation, data set organization, management, the metadata that allows us to access and discover those data sets. And of course, there's institutions, as Aaron just mentioned, it's about the structures of science. A lot of this is what institutional measures allow us to have that discovery layer? Um, what kinds of principles for cooperation do we have um, among ourselves as scientists? Um, and so all of this is to say that a lot of the traditional ways that we model collaboration, um, which is what I've focused on uh, over the past maybe a decade or so of, of my work, has been not only publications to look at some of the properties that characterize science, you know, and everyone here, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but we know there's small world properties. We see clustering tendencies. We see power law dis distributions. And these are the, have been called the laws of literature. Um, but of course, now that we have scientific products and software, there's different ways to characterize what science is because of access to different sorts of, um, especially data intensive products. And so what, what I'm arguing here and in a lot of our work is premised on that data intensive nature of science raises new challenges. And of course, opportunities, I should put in parentheses for quantitative studies of science. And so when we look at the tip of the iceberg, you know, publications, what comes out of the outputs of science, the literature start to dig deeper. We look at software, we look at data products. Um, but, you know, where we do look below the surface of the iceberg here, we're often um, looking at sharing. We're looking at, again, the end of the research life cycle. But what happens before that um, is something that we still need to look at. So much of my work has focused on the metadata available in open data repositories. Now, who here has heard of GeneBank? Yeah. Uh, yes, well, Daniel, we wrote a paper together on that, so I expected it. <laughs> um, so the GeneBank, Dataverse, Figshare, these are examples of repositories with a rich set of, of course, big data. But what comes with big data? big metadata. So we can exploit these big metadata to try to understand the scientific enterprise. And specifically, I've looked at collaboration and knowledge diffusion. Now you can see um, this big trend line. I don't know if I would run a ride this roller coaster, but it goes, it shoots straight up here where we have actually an exponential growth in the number of data sets submitted to GeneBank. So what we've done is taken the GeneBank sample records and use not only the publication metadata, but also the data set metadata to model collaboration. Now, this is, uh, I'm just gonna give you a couple of our main findings just so I can convince you that this is a good data source to use. And I would argue we need to start to really dig our teeth into how can we more systematically use data set metadata. So one thing we find is that the overlap between data set collaborations and publications, um, it's low. It's actually consistently low. So who are those people in the data set submission network? Um, this suggests there's invisible labor going on that's supporting the publication authors at the other end of production. As well, we're finding that there are some great predictive variables that are lurking within the data set production network. And so we can use those variables to better predict certain core features of science like knowledge diffusion. As well, we see that the clustering coefficient is a downward trend, which seems to have a more um, a flatter organization of the network, which has implications, as you know, for knowledge diffusion, as well as how democratic science is organized. Um, we also see different assortativity patterns. And this is the last thing that I'll tell you. But here, all I want you to do is look at the blue line, much different than what we see in the publication network. The blue line represents data set assortativity. 
It means that people in the data set who are producing data sets are connecting with people who are very different from them in terms of how many degrees they have, how many links, how many collaborations. So this is a distinctive property of the data set submission network that we don't see in publications. So all of this is to say, my research is moving forward in this direction that is focusing on data sets. Um, my next step is to look at the data set networks between North and South collaborations. Um, it's a little bit of a problematic way to, to talk about uh, you know, global collaborations, but still ongoing in terms of how to better operationalize um, North and South. So thank you very much. That's a brief overview. I hope I didn't go over five minutes. I probably did. So thank, thank you, you everyone. so much, Sarah. Yeah, that was perfect. So Caroline, please. Okay, let me try to share my screen. Is this working? Yes. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm an economist at UC Berkeley um, and I'm sort of broadly interested in these questions of how do incentives and career concerns um, shape the behavior of scientists and in turn sort of shape the production of new knowledge. I think, you know, some people from a distance might think science is sort of this very pure, and I was hearing a little bit of like the last panel uh, or the last talk was maybe touching on some of these things. I think from a distance, people think of scientists as like, they have these like incredibly pure motivations. All they care is just about like creating the most important new knowledge. And I think, you know, economists, I don't want to say take a more cynical view, but they sort of think, you know, that can sort of be true. And at, at the same time, people have careers that they care about and the incentives that are around them are going to just really shape people's behavior. And that's something that I just think is sort of interesting and probably true. And so just to give you an example of sort of one one type of one set of incentives that uh, my co-author Ryan and I were thinking a lot about was this idea that in science it's really important to be first. Um, if you think about who gets to name this the new species after them, it's the person who finds it first. It's not necessarily the person who describes that new species the most carefully. And so we took sort of a deep dive into this one field of science called structural biology. And I don't want to show you all of these slides, but I'll just show you a couple of them to sort of give you the idea. So we were very uh, interested in this, in this fact that uh, researchers who are doing, especially if they're doing basic science, so they're trying to do this kind of science that's about understanding the world, but that's not leading to sort of a new technology that you can commercialize. They're not going to be just motivated by profit. A big component of what motivates them is credit. And if we dole out credit, at least in part for being first, you've created this very strong incentive to be first. And so if you're sort of an economist, you think, well, you know, how is that going to make people behave? And we thought about, you know, is, is this a good incentive in science or not? And we thought there's sort of, it's, it's hard to say, right? It might make people work really hard and get their work out quickly and be very public about what their work, because if you want to get credit for being first, you need to show you've done. Those all might be good things. But we were interested in this idea that if it's so important to be first, might you cut quality and do lower quality research? Cut, sorry, cut corners and do lower quality research. Um, and we thought this is a cool idea, but how do you measure quality in science? And we even sort of found these, these neat quotes from, from sort of scientists saying, yes, this is like something we worry about. We thought it seemed really hard to measure this. And so we zoomed in on this field called structural biology, and I'll skip most of this, but just show you. This is a field where scientists are trying to solve the 3D structures of proteins. And what's very cool about this is that there's these very clean, clear projects and you have a conceptual way of measuring how good of a job did they do on this particular project. And so just here's kind of a visual example. For every protein that they solve, you can see a score of the refinement resolution. And you can see in this picture, it's like the same protein, but as you move to the right, it's at a higher and a better and better refinement resolution. These are things that are sort of very concrete to measure. And what we can show is that for certain types of proteins, um, that the scientific community has deemed really important. We can see that, let's see if I can find the, the graph. We can see that there's these certain proteins, we call them high potential proteins, um, 
they look like they're really important. And you can see that a lot of people work on them. That's what this graph is showing you. These really important proteins have a lot of people working on them simultaneously on different teams. So in other words, if you're working on that protein, you feel like there's probably a lot of other people breathing down your neck, trying to also get there first. And those same proteins, you can see they're being finished faster. This is how long the scientists spend solving the model. And in turn, those same proteins look like they're being done with lower quality. And so, you know, this was sort of interesting to us. And then one step further, you can say, we were sort of trying to argue, this is really happening because people are competing to be first. And so one thing we were worried about is, you know, maybe these important proteins, not only are people competing to solve them, they're just really hard. That would be like a reason that you would see them be lower quality. That's not about this sort of career incentives racing to be first. So what we did was we found um, a subset of the proteins are being worked on by researchers at Structural Genomics Institutes who anecdotally seem less focused on being first. They're not typically trying to publish in journals and we can use them as a sort of control group. And so what we can do here is this is the same graph of how long are scientists spending on the protein structures. And in blue, you have the university scientists. So you can see when the protein's really important, they spend less time on it. Whereas in red, you have these structural genomics researchers, they spend more time when the protein's important. So we think that when you turn off this need to be first, you don't have people spending less time on the more important structures. And you can do this analysis again, looking at the quality of the protein structure. And you can see that for both groups, when it's a more important protein, the quality is lower, but that trend is much more pronounced for the universities who we think feel more competition. And so that's sort of the takeaway we, we thought here is, if you put strong career incentives in place, and in this case, this incentive that being first is really important, and we have other work that actually documents this, the, peop the person who solved the protein structure first, they get to publish in a better journal, they get more citations. If that's the system you have in place, if you're an economist, it's not surprising that people respond to that incentive. And so I think that just raises interesting questions of, you know, how do we want to organize science? How much competition do we want there to be? We focused here on like a potential negative of competition. My view is that it's not all bad, um, but I just think the incentives shape the science. And so you should think very carefully. I think a lot of the systems we have are in some sense inherited from hundreds of years ago, back when famous people had patrons who just, you know, funded their science. And I don't know that we've like, that all of these systems are sort of optimally designed and, and maybe that's disappointing, but maybe it's also exciting because it actually means that if we're a little bit thoughtful, there's a lot of scope to make science more efficient by aligning the incentives that these researchers face with sort of what a social planner would want. And so I'll stop there, um, but yeah, great to be here and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you so much, Caroline. So Gisem, please go ahead. Yeah, just one second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let me make it full screen. Oops, is this with the notes or the? It's the notes, or... yeah. Okay, I can swap, I guess. Now it should be okay right now. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, and thank you very much, Daniel, for, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. So as you mentioned during your uh, introduction, I work a lot with uh, government agencies at the federal and state and local level. So today I want to choose a, a project uh, which highlights the importance of using state uh, data, uh, the limitations of using um, federal data sources. And um, that's that's what I'll be doing today. Um, so as a motivation uh, here, I put some facts uh, and uh, we know that uh, there are gender and um, race-based inequalities. Can you guys hear me well, by the way? Sorry. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, there are gender and, um, you know, race-based and other socioeconomic factors uh, that lead to certain inequalities, especially in science. And um, pandemic actually uh, exaggerated some of these inequalities, and uh, we have seen that. So uh, the other important thing to note is that immigrants uh, make up actually more than half of the STEM PhD workers in the US, uh, but there are wage gaps uh, when, when you compare their incomes to the, their US-born counterparts. 
So uh, the point here is that you know uh, we need high quality data on foreign born scientists and engineers to study um, the, these inequalities to understand what, what these people do and uh, where they come from and uh, what they do after their education they, they, as they transition to workforce. Um, so this project is about uh, basically creating a new data infrastructure uh, to study um, foreign born population scientists and engineers in, in the US. And, um, you know, to, to address this question, National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, which is a, which is a statistical agency within the NSF, um, created an RFP re um, request for proposals, and uh, they selected some projects. And this is one of the projects that was selected uh, based on these submissions. Uh, as Coleridge, we teamed up with agencies uh, in three different states, New Jersey, Arkansas, and Kentucky, and um, our goal is to create a data infrastructure with the state data uh, and to identify gaps to study this topic. So what can we capture using state data and what are the gaps that we can address and uh, what are the additional data sources that we can use uh, to identify to study this population basically. So uh, this is the first year of the project. So it's still a work in progress. So I don't have a lot to uh, share in terms of state, but one of the things that we're doing in this first year is doing uh, benchmarking using the federal data sources. So what can we learn from publicly available federal data sources from the federal statistical systems? And what are the constraints, uh, you know, coming from these data sources? So that actually motivates us to, um, to look at administrative state administrative data sources. So this is what we are doing. And hopefully in the future, I'll have uh, some results from the state data, which I can share. So today it will be more around the um, federal data sources. So here I listed some of the uh, data sources that allow researchers to study this topic. And the Census Bureau is, made, is the primary source for census and survey data on a foreign born population. Uh, ACS, I don't know if you guys know, American Community Survey is a nationally representative survey of U.S. households. Uh, it surveys approximately uh, 3.5 million households per year uh, and collects information on their family, demographic and socioeconomic characteristics, as well as a selected property character. So foreign born is something we can capture using ACS. The other one I want to mention from the Census Bureau is the um, current population survey which is more focused on the labor force statistics. So what do what these people do uh, in the labor force? Then we have the NCSCS. Uh, they conduct uh, various studies and uh, these include SDR, the survey of doctorate recipients. It's also a nationally representative survey and the survey of earned doctorates, which is a census of all individuals receiving doctor, uh, doctorates from US institutions. Now we have NCS, uh, which is a National Center for Education and Statistics. So here I put some of the, um, you know, visuals that highlight what, what we're observing. So this is from the data.census.gov. They provide a very nice tool, actually, so we can look at uh, the population uh, in various ways. Here I uh, plotted the proportion of the population uh, that is poor and born in different states in the US. So we can capture that using the American Community Survey, as I mentioned, and you can see that it goes up to 27% um, in some of the states such as New York and California. That's where the foreign born, foreign born population proportions are really high. Uh, and we can then actually using the uh, American Community Survey, we can also study at the state level what's happening. So these allow us to do benchmarking because what we will do is actually look at the administrative data from these states and do some comparisons. What we're capturing, are, are they really representative and uh, are the numbers consistent with each other? So we can see that for our partnering states, New Jersey has the highest foreign born population with 23% of the population. And it, the, these numbers are for 5%, 4% for Kentucky and Arkansas. And we can see for all these states that more than half of the foreign born population with advanced degrees are in science and engineering fields. So uh, most of them actually do study science and engineering. So uh, we can look at the data over time uh, for the United States as well as for different states. And we can see that 
foreign born advanced degree holders range between 17% to 19% in the United States in the last decade. Um, and the, the overall population is actually around 12 to 13% in the US. So here you can see again the high proportion for New Jersey in terms of foreign born uh, scientists and engineers. And the last one that I want to mention is the, uh, the report that is published by the by NCSCS. This is the Science and Engineering Indicators report. They use multiple data sources. And one of the focuses is actually on the labor force in the US. And uh, there we can also capture the foreign born population. And um, I'm going to you know, mention very quickly uh, this is a table taken from the report. And um, we observe the number of number and the proportion of foreign born science and scientists and engineers uh, have risen over time so we see increases uh, in the us but again this data does not allow us to look at state level data these are nationally representative numbers and we can also look at the occupational categories here uh, we can see that uh, foreign born scientists are especially prevalent in software programming and other computer related uh, jobs so that's what they do once they finish their studies and you know in, in another uh, table i also saw that most were from asia uh, and india and china being the leading countries uh, in, ter in terms of foreign born population okay so i want to make three points i sh i showed you some of the uh, results from uh, a quick investigation of federal data sources um, and you know they really provide rich insights so these are national representative uh, estimates which is really good which is uh, high, which is of high quality these are from the federal statistical agencies however there are constraints that limit our understanding uh, of the population so first of all access so uh, most of the uh, microdata is restricted so it's very difficult to actually obtain that data and uh, publicly available data is only available in pre-made tables and aggregated forms so you cannot really do ca custom analysis with these publicly available data sources and the other problem is that uh, the coverage and the granularity so you, to be able to make studies at local levels or um, level at levels that are different than national or state level then uh you're uh you're in pro you know there are problems there are challenges with that so for example and also like coverage in terms of populations as well sdr the data set that i mentioned uh only covers those with u.s awarded doctorates but not persons who receive their doctorate abroad so the coverage is also not full uh and this is a problem because when you're making policies you know policies about education interventions about education they are usually at the local level and you know you don't have those numbers you have national numbers but if you're going to make policies then you really need the um, uh, you need you need to have the data at the level that the policies are made right so that that's a challenge and uh, these data also have missing information ACS as I mentioned is a very uh, good data source However, we do not know where they obtain their degrees. We were talking about foreign born scientists and engineers, but we don't even know whether they receive their degrees in the US. So, uh, you know, like then if you want to understand the return on investment, then you really need that information and which you can get from uh, state data. So the point here is then is to the, the linking of federal and state administrative data will actually allow us to study some of these things. So. Uh, if we have information on the school enrollment, completion information, unemployment insurance claims, then we can actually start looking at some of these things. Uh, so administrative records will, will allow us to look at immigration flows into the country, uh, into the states, uh, in and out of the state as well. So that's very important to know. And we can actually track individuals um, post-education into workforce if we linked different uh, data from different systems within the states right so um but the last point here is that of course there are privacy and confidentiality concerns that we need to be very careful about because most of these data have social security numbers information that allow us identify individuals so we should really be careful about that that's why 
we have, uh, you know, as, as college, we have the ADRF, which is the secure enclave where states can share their data and do not feel that their data will be uh, used by other purposes. So that was, th these three points are main takeaways from my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gimes. Uh, okay, last but not least, we have Chao Chun. Please go ahead. All right. Can you see my slides? Can anyone see my yes. slides? Are, are you seeing yes. the presentation notes oh. or seeing the... The, the notes, the speaker notes, you have to switch. Oh, oh the speaker notes? Okay, sorry, let me swap this. Can you see my presentation model now? Yes. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Um, thank you so much for Dan, uh, to Dan for the invitation. And I have to confess that I um, interpreted Dan's message wrong. I thought this is going to be a gender theme of discussion. So I prepared everything around the gender. Uh, so anyway, um, overall, so this is something that I'm working on right now. So it's more about all the understanding all the gender difference, gender differences in the career trajectories of scientists. So what I'm mostly, uh, mostly want to talk about today is how, uh, uh, how parenthood contributes to gender gaps in academia, as well as some other gender differences that I think are important and uh, in the gender difference that we observe in academia right now. So uh, in care of everyone's time, precious time, so I'm, because I told them uh, I'm supposed to limit my presentation to five minutes, so I'm just, uh, gonna be quickly uh, run through all the results here. So the, as for this, um, how, parent, how parenthood contributes gender disparities in academia, uh, we used some data from both a large scale survey that we sent out to about 100,000 um, respondents that we collect their emails from Web of Science as well as their uh, profiles, publication profiles from Web of Science. So the, we got about 10,000 uh, valid responses and we used about 8,000 in here. What we're trying to understand is whether um, the appearance, the, the appearance status of, of those respondents uh, is related to their career performance and whether the support and uh, work family conflict, those kind of stats that we are collecting through the survey are actually related to their career trajectories, career performance. So this is an overview of the parenthood and gender uh, in among the respondents that we got. So what we got is we we found is that in academia, there are more women. There are less women are less likely to have children than men. Well, if you read all statistics by U.S. Census, um, the number is women are more likely to be parents than men after a certain age. So this is kind of slightly different from the general population. And we also specifically asked about those um, academics who do not have children. And what we found is no mothers women, those who do not have children, they are more likely to report that their decision to be child-free, to not have any child is related to their career considerations. And we think these kind of disabilities in gender disparities in parenthood in academia is actually somehow related to how women and men differ in their perceptions on the compatibility of, gen of children with academic career, right? So we asked them about, hey, um, what do you think are the impact, or if there's any impact, positive and active uh, of, child, of, of children on your career development? What we found is that women are more likely than men to report an active impact of children that have on their career development across all career stages. So you can see these are all regression results and they are, positive, they are um, significant across four career stages that we are monitoring. So this is uh, the difference between women and men. And uh, we also looked at whether there are gender gaps among parents and among non-parents. 
um, in terms of subjective career achievements and objective career, career achievements. What you are seeing here are three measures of subjective career achievements. They are research satisfaction, career satisfaction, community, uh, community recognition, which means how you feel recognized by, their, by your scholarly communities. We can see clearly that mothers are less likely than fathers to be satisfied with research satisfaction and community recognition. While among non-parents, as you can see from here, this first bar here, there are no significant differences. If we move on to the objective career achievements, we, which we measure, we operationalize using annual relative publication, average relative citation, and annual relative co-authors. So you can still see that there are gender differences, especially regarding um, the productivity, annual productivity. There are some gender difference among parents in terms of citation and collaboration as well. But if you look at these non-parents, there are no significant gender differences. So this is uh, some. We also asked them about um, what kind of, whether you have encountered work-family con conflicts um, and what kind of work-family conflicts you have run into, time-based, stream-based, or behavior-based. We had a lot of questions. Uh, the survey has about 62, I believe, 62 questions, and this is what we got. We can see that regardless of parenthood status, women are more likely than men to experience higher levels of conflicts in all three forms of work-family conflict. And of course, parents experience higher levels of conflict than non-parents. So, and we also asked about whether your partners are supporting, your partner is, was supporting you for child, uh, um, to, uh, for child rearing, right? So what we found here is a consistent pattern, again, uh, in terms of difference between non-parents and non-parents and parents. So what we found is mothers are less likely than fathers to receive time, emotional, and physician support. Well, this pattern actually does not hold for non-parents, women, and men. So we did some mediation fact analysis and trying to see whether the partner support and work family conflict actually uh, intervene or contribute to the gender difference we see between women and men among parents and non-parents. So what we found is that mothers actually receive less general support, experience higher, uh, higher levels of work-family conflict, receives more professional support, but which leads to their lower levels of any productivity and citation. So um, just to summarize, um, as a little takeaway from this uh, results, what we found is that um, a lot of gender gaps that we actually see, especially if you read a lot of large studies in Queen's uh, that we published a couple of years ago, we, we found gender gaps in productivity, we found gender gaps in citation, right? So what we are seeing here is a lot of gender gaps only are noticeable or significant in the parent group, not in the non-parent group. So if we consider that actually, if you, you recall the first image, parent, parents actually make up about more than 70% of uh, the academic um, population. So we might consider that a lot of gender gaps we actually are seeing right now in, in academia in terms of their achievements are actually parenthood gender gaps because of the gender gaps among parents, but not among non parents. There are no significant gender gaps based on our data, but of course, this is subjective to uh, additional uh, analysis as well. And what I, um, what we are, based on what we found in this study, we are also we also consider that any um, productivity-based metrics uh, that we use, typically use, or the current system is using to evaluate uh, for tenure, promotion, or awards, or any any other things, or hiring, right? So these will hurt mothers, will hurt mothers more because, as we can see from the um, metrics, that mothers, because of the children, they, um, they are less productive, they are less, in, uh, less uh, active in terms of, or less collaborative in terms of number of collaborators. So we consider address, addressing gender gaps, uh, gender inequalities in academia is, um, is not a single, is that not a goal that can be achieved by any single um, actions. As we can see from our results, that partner support actually helps with the gender gaps are reducing the gender gaps in academia. 
So we, we think that addressing gender inequality in academia will need a collective intelligence, will need the involvement of both government institutions as well as um, families. So these are the things that we found from uh, how uh, gender, how parenthood contributes gender gaps in academia. But there, like I said, and our, Aaron also mentioned that too, science is, is a social system and it's complicated. It's more than just singly, uh, simply claiming that it was uh, parenthood that single, as a single factor contributing the gender differences we observe, right? So there are other differences. So one of them um, is the gender nature of authorship paper that we published last year. There was, what we found in this paper was that women actually receives less credits or, or less likely to receive the, um, receive the deserved credits in terms of authorship, in the form of authorship, in authorship byline when the paper gets published. So this is what we found. And this is a pattern that is consistent across almost all disciplines that we examined, natural science and engineering, uh, medical science, which is slightly bit better, by the way, and social science as well. So um, there are some ongoing work that our group is working on that is looking at whether there are any gender differences in the RMP, which stands for Rate My Professor. Uh, this is a website that a lot of professors, a lot of students use to uh, rate and comment on their professors. And what we found, uh, which is, uh, this paper is currently under submission. So what we see here is that, for example, for there's a notable gender difference, right? For example, we can see when uh, those uh, students call their professors, female professors, they call them teachers, right? So when they call their male professors, what we found is they address them as professor X, Y, and Z instead of teacher or miss, right? And uh, so this is another gender difference, right? How does this, how this is intervening or is contributing to gender difference that we observe in the, uh, in the, um, Science workforce in general is something that we need to discuss as well, right? So we also looked at how Wikipedia citation differences actually bias or, or present any gender differences. What we found here is that in, I mean, across all disciplines here, many of the um, Wikipedia actually prefers to cite uh, papers by, um, uh, uh, by men. Either men is the first author, the single author, the solo author, or the key author, which could be the last author or corresponding author. So these are also uh, some other gender differences we found in the science system. So with this, I'd like to thank you for uh, the time. And uh, this is a link to the paper, How Parenthood Contributes to Gender Gaps in Academia. Uh, it was published um, in eLife last month. And how many questions? Thank you so much, Xiao Chun. Uh, this uh, it was perfect is the perfect theme for this uh, panel because we will have like a second section where we hope I hope to discuss these and other issues related to biases in in our field. So perfect. Uh, so uh, so I'll I'll start with a presentation uh, a question that I sent you through email just to get started and let's go through the same order that we went. Uh, let's maybe uh, keep it. Um, maybe well perhaps short uh, but we should have a good 40 minutes uh, left um, and then at the end we'll have questions from the audience uh, so don't worry if you have questions for the uh, for the panel okay so the question is and I'll start with uh, with Sarah the question was whether we like it or not data is the fuel that we use in science of science uh, for many studies and that's probably why we have all of these amazing results coming out but from your own perspective and your research what kind of studies are not being done because we are missing the data so do you have any thoughts about the importance of those issues and what to do about them this is such a great question so We've seen that a lot of studies are that are really exciting are being done because we have access to things like trace data from the digital exhaust, um, so to speak, of you know our software log files, etc. Um, but one thing that I really wanted to draw attention to in science of science, especially around um, the fantastic 
work that um, my co-panelists are doing as well around gender, around incentives, around the international nature of science is missing data. There are a couple of initiatives that are looking specifically at missing data. And what we mean by missing data, if we if we actually take a look back, if we take a step back, that is a very mm, uh, non-neutral statement, right? So it's missing because it should be there. Um, it's missing because it wasn't collected. It's missing because maybe someone does not want to be surveilled. Um, and so I think about data feminism when I think about missing data just from the start. Um, and some, some of these things are uh, related to maybe more traditional science of science studies. So of course, my baton that I always wave is data sets and the invisible labor of those data plumbers um, or what have been called the custodians of the internet are those people that often are doing the data cleaning work that are doing all of the, um, the aspects of curation of the data, such as at the repository, such as the individuals who work at Web of Science. Um, and so the kinds of studies that are now possible um, are the ones where we can look through um, the, the types of division of labor. Um, so great work by Cassidy Sujimoto, for example, is looking at using the credit taxonomy, which is a contributor role taxonomy to understand what individuals are doing what kinds of work on the production of a paper. Um, as well, I'd be really excited to, and this is, you know, some people might call this touchy-feely, but as we've observed, uh, scientists' intentions are not pure uh, in the sense that they are their mothers, their they have uh, multiple other priorities. And so in this looking at emotions, you know, I would challenge us as science of science researchers to uh, maybe even look into affect, look into emotion, look into routines that scientists are in engaging in in their day-to-day -day, um, day -day work that are associated with certain trends that we're interested in, such as collaboration, mentorship. Um, and so the kinds of studies that we could do would be those that are you know, before the publication outputs. Um, and some of those might challenge us to look at different ways of collecting data, um, whether that's sociometers, whether that's following them around at conferences, um, whether that's trying to negotiate with the NIH so that they can get data citation um, data to <laughs> that is um, a little more systematically collected. So there's, there's many other examples. I'll um, direct everyone to a great website uh, as I just finish up and I'll paste it in the chat, but it's the library of missing data sets. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So Caroline, or really, if, if anybody wants to add, or just, I'll just open the panel to, to free discussion, but if not, we can go with Caroline. I don't really think I can give an answer that's uh, nearly as good or comprehensive as that one. Um, one thing I've thought a little bit about is just there's this huge reliance on either patent data or citation data. Um, and I think that's because it has these two features that are really nice. One is that it's like freely available and the other is that it cuts across fields. So people, I think, really want to make st statements about like science as a whole. And it's hard to think about sort of other measures of like productivity or innovation that sort of cut across fields in the same way. But I guess this is maybe just a more of a preference on my part. I think it can be valuable to, at the expense of generality, pick a field where you can measure these things in other ways that may be better or just let you say different things that you wouldn't be able to say if you look at citations only. Um, and I just would challenge people to do more of that and challenge people to I mean, it's, it's a little bit tough. You know, I think the criticism we often get is, yeah, this is cool, but like, you know, how important is structural biology and does this generalize? And my response is like, maybe it doesn't generalize, but we're able to ask questions that we can't ask if we are constraining ourselves to look at science as a whole. And I just think that there's really space for both. Um, and I, but I think that sort of to date, we've been like much more focused on sort of citations, patents, and I don't know, personally, I think it's really fun to dig into a particular area of science where you can really understand what the data mean, what these different outputs are measuring. And I think there should be more of that. 
Thank you. So if exam, I, could just I know that, on. oh yeah, go ahead, please, please. Go ahead. Just a qu quick follow-up to that. I would even say like doing mixed method studies. Um, there's some scholars that are doing like network, classical network approaches, but then embedded within those scientific communities. And so for example, in astronomy, what does like one paper mean versus, you know, four conference papers and adjusting your variables for that after doing a back and forth. And that's um, computational in its own, yeah, sort of a hybrid approach. So I really appreciate it. And I think as you learn about the specifics of individual fields and how they work, it kind of makes you look at these st cross science studies and just think like, it's actually hard to know what to think of all of these things because every field has quite specific norms and like count exactly counting papers may not make as much may not make a whole ton of sense in comparing paper counts across fields and stuff like that. The reason why I chose gene bank was not because I am a biologist it's because they're so good at providing trace data you know so very much like who's heard of the drunkard's fallacy everyone no so it's this is my favorite thing that was the like, lamp the lamp post is this the same as the lamp post yeah 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 this one he's that yes, I, it's beautiful it's a very true <laughs> this is like go ahead no 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 go, please continue sorry oh my goodness well the the lamp post fallacy it says essentially says that there's a person who's had like a drink too much and they're looking for their keys they lost their keys oh my god where'd they go and so they only look under the lamp post because there's a light that's shining where they can see but the keys are like in the river you know you're looking in the wrong place essentially um you know and not to beat around the street light effect yeah <laughs> but yeah these like the different ways that you can um kind of uh counter that as well is really interesting challenge as well yeah yeah no great point so i will uh, have a maybe different angle because i think uh, both points were re really important from sarah and caroline uh so the uh, i'm going to stress the data linkage the importance of linking data sets right like that's where we can, we're not able to answer some of the questions. So, uh, and uh, let me give you the, you know, let me touch again the topic that I'm studying, right? So uh, we have states and uh, people are there, people, scientists and engineers are there, right? They're educated, they go, to, they, um, then they're going transition, in, transitioning into the workforce. So you need to two different data systems to be linked to, uh, to really understand what's happening to these people, where they are studying, what they are doing afterwards. And on top of that, you need different states to share data with each other too, right? Because, you know, people move across states. So they study somewhere, they can move somewhere else to, to work, right? And it happens quite a lot. So um, since states do not share data with each other, or since different agencies within states do not share data with each other. You cannot link them and you cannot really understand what's going on, what the output is, what the return on investment is. So it's very important to create these data enclaves where states can freely share their data and researchers can actually link these data sets and try to address some of these questions that are not being addressed right now. So I think that's also very, it's, it's similar to the missing data, right? So you, you're missing what's happening afterwards or what happened before uh, there in the data that you have. So uh, I think that's very important. And even something as simple as funding, you think that if you're going to be state funded, that there would be a very clear linkage. We're doing a project right now where we're trying to link NIH funding data from the exporter. I've talked to Han about this as well mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the gene bank data sets. And we're finding there's like a many to many relationship, which is a very fun thing to try to resolve. Um, but you think something as basic as funding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I 100% agree with many of the ideas um, that my, um, my co-panelists have mentioned. But the other thing that I have been thinking a lot, this is a question that I ask myself a lot, what is missing from science of science studies? I think what we are missing, what we are mostly missing is studying 
the salient of science, right? We have been studying publications, we have been studying patterns, we have been studying those professors or researchers who published, right? So what we are seeing are those what we consider can be considered as successful, the success, right, of science. They got published, they got patents approved, they got proposals funded, right? But we never, I mean, there are some smaller studies right now, but we never had a systematic way of tracking what has failed. Right, so there are manuscripts. So I, I think I read somewhere uh, from Elsevier. Um, they're saying that they only accept about 20 to 40 percent of manuscripts submitted to them. So there are many of them got got rejected. Right. So why they got rejected? What can we learn from those rejections? Right. A lot of times we're talking about people hiring being a professor. We are studying out. Uh, how successful they are. We are looking at the great features of those successful hires. We are studying those established scientists. But people, I mean, I, I mean, I myself will probably don't talk too much about my failure, right? There's afraid of talking failure in the current system. And there is a lack of um, ways of documenting those unsuccessful sciences, right? So we also we uh, we lack the structure of documenting those who left academia. We, uh, we don't have a way of su successfully uh, getting data up from like for those reject the manuscripts, for reject the proposals, for reject the patterns, right? So this is something that I think we are missing. And I truly believe that um, studying those failure is also going to be an important thing for science of science studies because we can build, we can learn from them what's not working right, right? What's working right? So yeah, so overall, I think we need good data for studying the unsuccessful side of science overall, no matter in what form, in which ways. I remember, I think mathematics has a website or something called um, uh, My Rejected Manuscripts or something. They asked all those mathematicians to actually deposit their um, rejected manuscripts there. So this is, but this is a small effort that mathematics has been doing and they, it's not very popular yet, but I think we, um, science of science, should think about how we can promote a way of documenting or studying the unsuccessful science of science for um, the better doing of science. That's it. So just now, I think if you have follow-up points, otherwise I can ask something. Uh... One aspect I think that is worth mentioning as well. I love uh, the the example of, of rejected <laughs> papers because, like you say, if it's sixty to seventy percent of the scientific enterprise, like are we only counting people who are successful <laughs> in how we are developing policies and 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 incentive structures? One um, p exciting sort of frontier is data sets as well. This is like the underdogs of science. And so, you know, we're very excited as a as a civilization about data intensive science and the fourth paradigm of science and the revolution of science um, in, ter in terms of like the data intensiveness of big data. But there's still a lack of maturity around the citation infrastructure. And um, one anecdote that I just want to share is um, I was speaking with this wonderful Italian um, uh, scientometric scholar named uh, John Maria Silvello, and he was working <laughs> on um, data set citation as well as trying to track the impact or use of data sets. And the way that he was doing it um, was very different than my idea. So my idea was, let's talk to the, the National Institute of Health and try to have them track in their system the data set downloads, the data set um, production, et cetera. He said, you know, it's going to take a long time. Why don't we create our own database that produces a paper every time that somebody submits a data set? This paper will get cited. And so these alternative approaches that go sort of around traditional ways that we think that the scholarly research infrastructure works, especially around citation and impact. Um, and I think what this raised was a bigger question about non-traditional products of science and what counts as success. And so part of this was, do we try to change the ways that, for example, Google Scholar is tracking things? Do we develop new metrics for impact where we see them not really being affected or serving the purposes we thought if they are sort of perverse incentives? Um, or do we, you know, sort of try to work around 
we, do we work around those systems or within those systems when we're doing science of science more broadly? And and again, that that does I think apply to why do uh, why uh, how to look at rejections as well um, as other non alternative products of science or intermediate products of science. Yeah, data sets. <laughs> Sarah, this is Mariella. I have a question for you. Can Thank you, you hear me, Erica? Yes, okay, thanks. Sarah. I had to turn on turn on a different microphone. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm a librarian. I'm a science librarian at a mid sized comprehensive university, and I really struggle with kind of telling the story of the library's role and you know information science generally. It it's it's an uphill battle, and it's a bit frustrating at first. And it's really cool to be a part of this cohort that's obviously so interdisciplinary, but but recognizing that leg of the stool, so to speak, of the information sciences. And I just wonder if you could speak to that generally. Mm. So thank you so much, Mary Ellen. The, the issue of libraries and librarians as being sort of um, underestimated in their role uh, as data curators and as sort of information navigators. Um, you're actually having a wonderful watershed moment right now and have been in terms of a lot of critical metadata studies. And so what we've seen in, in much of the critical work on science of science, but as well as um, how data is developed is to look at the full research life cycle. And so I think whenever you're talking about your, your value add or um, the ways that librarians are contributing to big data or big data intensive science is the development of metadata, as well as because uh, we know that data is only data by virtue of someone defining this is an important thing to collect. And so when I think about the work of data curators, when I think about the work of librarians, a lot of that is being critical about what are the drop down fields in the gender box? You know, what are the things that you're collecting that are representing the communities that you're collecting? So in terms of a sort of value statement, for the libraries, I would say that part of this is recognizing that big data relies on um, those people who are at the beginning of the research life cycle. So I'd love to talk a little bit more, um, but for the first part, you know, librarians and their role connection with data is it's great. Okay, so I'm gonna move in the interest of time. Uh, to the second part of this, and if you were missing some points uh, in, the, in the first part that I called of the discussion, please feel free to just continue your points. But I wanted to ask you uh, that uh, using historical data in science of science of, exposes us to, to biases, of course. Uh, most of the data that we have, most of the scientific outputs, publications, affiliations, citations, come from a mostly white and male dominated scientific uh, environment from the past. So that is improving a little bit, but as Dan showed, we might never achieve parity in some fields. So how do you think science of science can help increase representation in science? Uh, and this can also might mean in science of science, if you feel there is something deficient in, in our own little field, and I hear by representation, I mean very broadly, not just gender, race, but it could be socioeconomical factors, country of origin, language, all kinds of aspects. I'll just open the floor, but if not, we can follow with uh, the order that we established before. So sorry if you want to start. Sure. Yes. So the data that we have access to is largely pale, stale, and male. Um, if I can reinterpret your question, no, I'm just <laughs> um, So yes, the historical data, there's a few intersectional aspects. Um, so if we think about one thing that strikes me initially about the historical nature of the data is that, of course, we are working on data that was published after a long academic cycle as well. So many of our findings that are splashed across nature and science, if we're lucky, um, or very ambitious, um, 
say, you know, small teams disrupt large team to develop, et cetera. And these are based on historical data, um, based in legacy systems, of course. And so I would just look at sort of the temporal rhythms of science and really take into consideration those aspects of the data that we're um, focusing on. Um, one thing that excites me about this field is an area called citational justice. It's also called citational ethics. And this has been um, a lot, a, a collective of individuals who have um, been gunning for more attention to the ways that we cite and who is in our references. And they're actually developing software products to identify um, how uh, pale, stale, and male the references are. And this is very much not to say that um, there are, there's representation across multiple, um, it's, it's, it's looking at equality, um, but also that there is this systematic underrepresentation of um, women of intersectional identities. And so uh, this, again, is part of our sort of call to be science of science professionals is to look at the intersectional identities and be very mindful about citation practices, but also start to look at that data um, a little bit more as well in the references section. So that's what I would. Thanks. I'm, I may go next because I think it's relevant again, um, what, what you, it's relevant to what you were saying, Sarah, in terms of missingness, right? So in the studies, that we're looking at, um, you know, we're looking at the output, but we're not looking at the full research cycle, right? So we're only seeing what was published, what happened. For example, like there is this recent study, maybe you guys already talked about that during the summer school, but uh, Dr. Julia Lane uh, published recently uh, that women are credited less, right? So you look when you look at the publications, you see that gap, right? But you also need to go back and see who were the people involved in the research teams before, even before they started publishing, right? So then you can actually get a better picture about what the gaps are in terms of gender and, and other, other things. So uh, I'm gonna post the link here actually. So the, this is the Nature paper. Daniel, you know, I, you may have mentioned that during some of the classes. Yes, I, I just posted it here and Julia is presenting on, on Thursday as yeah, a preview, it, so great. Yeah, yeah, I was guessing so. So it's very important and from data science perspective, right? You, It's very important to understand data generating process. You have the data, what generated that data? And then coming back to Sarah, what are the, um, you know, what are the, uh, what is the degree of missingness and what, what is the cause of that missing data? So to be able to draw any conclusion, I think we need to first understand that, understand the data that we're dealing with to look at these gaps. So for this study, as you guys have heard, you know, they link the data. Again, data linkage is very important. They link the publication data to teams that were working on these projects so they can actually have a better picture about who were named authors, who were not named authors on these publications. So then you have a you have a worse picture than actually what you're seeing if you just looked at the publications as a research output. Caroline or Joshua? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, this is sort of a loaded topic and it's also not really the area that I'm an expert in. So I hesitate to offer up any strong opinions. I mean, I think the best thing we can do is try to shed light on some of these things. Um, and I know that, you know, I, I don't really work on this stuff. Part of it is that it's the data it makes it hard. So like, the data I use is like the web of science data. And, you know, if you wanted to just run some simple cross tabs of these things, as we've often wanted to do, um, it's not easy because the author names are a first initial and a last name. Now, of course, like people do figure out ways around this, but I just was sort of think, reflecting to myself, like, you know, you would probably get more of this kind of work if you just made it a little bit easier for researchers to do. And so that would be something like these big data curators who are already curating so much, why don't they just attach some demographics to the people's names or why don't they disambiguate? I mean, these are other issues, but um, yeah, this is, I don't, this is sort of not the stuff I focus on. So I don't, I'd rather get the floor to someone else. I, I echo many of the points that um, 
uh, my co-panelists mentioned. And the other thing uh, that I was thinking is a lot of studies that we are seeing in terms of uh, the social demographic features of, of the researchers of the science workforce, it, they, uh, we use a lot of imputation methods to infer gender, to infer race, but a lot of times, for example, gender can be a social identity that go beyond the binary classification, right? So it, we, a lot of gender imputation algorithms are not able to infer that this is a binary person, right? So that's one of the reasons why a lot of times I try to turn into um, survey, if survey studies, if it's possible to, to, to acquire their uh, gender classification. So um, with this being said, I, I, I mean, in a lot of studies that, uh, especially regarding, because that's something that I'm working on most, especially regarding gender, right? So a lot of studies, even if they got a lot of uh, gender classification for scientists, um, including non-binary group, uh, they would not include the analysis of the binary people by simply saying that this is such a small group that uh, we do not get any statistical meanings out of that, so we just forget about that. But I think this is something that we should be very cautious about because they are indeed a small section, a small part of the general population of the science workforce and if we keep discarding them by, by saying that, hey, they are small proportion of our analysis, it's not statistically significant, we forget about them. We will never be able to, to get or to achieve the goal, at least some, some of the goals that of my research has been uh, thinking about is to uh, increase the awareness of the underrepresentation of certain groups, certain marginalized groups, right? So if we keep throwing non-binary people out in gender studies, People will never pay attention to. But if you can, my take is that if you cannot provide any statistically significant analysis on, on those non binary people, which may, might be 1% of your population or less than 1% of the population, you can provide a descriptive, you can provide the uh, descriptive analysis, or you can provide some uh, text analysis, uh, not text, I mean, basic analysis of them. And by providing um, the interpretations, with consciousness of generalizability, right? And it's very also very important to uh, to think about, for example, a lot of times we study race. There, there, there are a lot of uh, methods studying um, impute. I mean, estimating race or ethnicity groups from names, right? So they will not they will not um, estimate those algorithms will not estimate multi race, right? Uh, a lot of times especially in the context of the of US, a lot of first name or last name based gen, uh, race imputations are not going to be perfect because of the complex of the issues of the last name naming uh, for different race and ethnicity groups. So I think it's very important. It's very important for us to uh, keep in mind that uh, we use methods with um, with carefulness, and we do not simply um, just uh, forget about smaller population samples, which I think they are indeed a small part of the uh, general science workforce, but they are still important. So this is something. I love that example, uh, and I and I think that there's also this um, issue around language too that really relates to exactly. Because you know, not only um, <laughs> questions about is English as the dominant language, but also the way that we're naming variables and defining yeah. variables. One thing that, and again, as Carolyn mentioned, this is um, a little bit of a, it's a definitely a loaded subject, but it's something that will only help us to like move forward if we really look at it. Um, one thing that strikes me is that maybe science writ large are slow, will name papers in ways that can be gendered or sexist or um, raci racially um, charged, such, such as using sort of folkloric metaphors. Um, one thing that I've observed is that many titles tend to have this sort of, in, in order to be sexier perhaps, um, have these hearkenings back to metaphorical um, or even folkloric titles, such as, you know, Sleeping Beauties in Science or thinking about um, how we talk about um, certain gender roles when we're when we're naming our papers when we're naming our variables 
And it's a very great way to bring attention, perhaps, to the field. Um, but it, it, you know, you also wonder about um, the ways that it could be harmful as well to re-entrenching ideas that we have about who is, you know, what are the roles of women as professors, as instructors. Um, and so that language use is, is important. And um, one thing that I just ran into in a, in a recent, um, in recent work that we're doing on global north sort of north-south collaborations in science around global health crises. Um, we're looking at some how often these collaborations occur, how are we gaining research capacity um, with certain researchers by gaining access to resources. And I stopped when I started to write about north-south as a hierarchy, as a divide, as a binary. Um, what are the other ways we can think about and characterize north-south? Um, it's very inaccurate to talk about the global north and the global south because there are researchers who are the leaders in their field, but they're characterized as global south. So you wonder how can we better name our variables, name the way that we talk about the, the scientific workforce that represents better. And so one, um, there's a great index that was developed um, in a different field. Uh, I think it was in econometrics. Uh, but it but it also been an agent like an international agency that looked at um this is not a very accurate reflection of the ways that people are accessing resources if we talk about global north global south so why don't we create a more granular index that talks about research capacity um that talks about social capital and so there are alternative methods out there that are that we can also plug into in our um studies and that can probably relate back to who we're citing or like what measures we're using and um, this can also apply to me measures of like of productivity. You know, maybe productivity isn't your published papers, but maybe it's your total output as the, you know as represented by archive um, with the X um, papers as well. And so, um, yeah, I would I would say there's a there's a question about you know we're thinking about intersectionality. Who are we excluding? in the in the in the um, participation in science of science studies as well if you know you're using um some some potentially marginalizing uh language as well as um uh and training students to use this as well so it's kind of like to stop this sort of uh, intergenerational or at least to break it apart a little bit and be a little bit more critical um in terms of our the ways that we're thinking about gender as well as um yeah international relations yeah and in terms of what we're missing in uh, the study of science, science and science is, is the uh, open source software development, right? And I think, Sarah, you mentioned that is one of the research outputs. It's not only publications or, you know, grants or patents, but we're missing the whole uh, development of open source software by uh, researchers at universities. These are, there's no market for that, right? There's no price. As an economist, that's how we look at things to measure them. What is the value? But um, people are developing packages, R packages, Python packages, and they are sharing with the world and these are being used a lot. So they should definitely be used to measure the productivity of the researchers. And this is a study that, uh, we, you know, I have been working on with the, again, National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics because they are interested in measuring research output. And there are, there's nothing right now to capture the development of open source software in, in universe. So when you're ranking universities, what are you looking at? You're looking at patents, you're looking at publications, citations from these publications, but uh, there's nothing that actually captures the development of open source software that are, that is very important right now because they're widely used, you know, from anyone in the world. So uh, that's, uh, that's another thing one should think about when we're thinking about impact of institutions impact of researchers uh you know how much a package you develop is being used by other packages dependencies among these packages you know this is it's very important to look at mm. great so i would like to open the floor for questions from the students uh and just open the floor in general uh to just have open mic uh please unmute yourself and ask us away i know that there are tons of comments in the chat oh i have a follow-up question for chao chun like in your uh analysis like uh, i see that there's some uh disparity or like a difference i'm wondering is that possible that uh you 
like uh, we can have some data for culture or religion because I see them in some different culture or religion that uh, different people have different behaviors and then it's possible I'm wondering if it is possible to see that from the from the science of science we see how people think and how people behave is deeper than the religion or or gender or race but we see the how people think reflect from science of science so just to clarify you were uh you were referring to the parenthood uh how parenthood contributes to academic uh gender uh, disparities right Is yes yes okay yes. yeah i i agree 100 percent cultural background race and ethnicity is highly i mean to me is very likely highly related to how i mean how the uh i mean how the division of labor happens within the family right uh how fat parents are supporting i know that a lot of asian parents they have grandparents come to the house to support taking care of the kids when the kids were little and then uh, it's not as common as in asian families as in other some other uh traditions with this being said we also collected i mean we were unable to collect like very detailed data, but we did collect uh, race in the Australian data, which we used as a control variable. And so this is one of the next steps that we are looking, we are actually doing, trying to find the intersectional kind of impact of race and ethnicity as well as gender, as as well as the, the uh, division of labor within the family, how that actually is related to the gender disparities that we see um, in the uh, academic workforce. Thank you very much. I, I guess related to that, uh, maybe this is less of a question than just a frustration. Um, as a sociologist, I feel like as we dig deeper in these questions, we're running into these places where we just run out of data. So we want to know things about class. We want to know things about uh, like parenthood um you know this is turning out to be really important but without doing a survey um we're so limited in being able to to tackle these issues so um like i said maybe not not, not a focus question but kind of just a, a frustration event um that it sounds like maybe well received in this forum yeah, I I 100% agree. Uh, a lot a lot of times when I'm analyzing my own data, I was like, oh, I wish I had this data. I wish I had this data, right? So I but I don't. And I mean, so like a lot of analysis actually uh, can be done with actually uh, social demographic data without actually uh, going to the survey, like the NIH grants data, right? They collect also all the I mean a lot of not all of them, but a lot of social demographic features of NIH grant applicants including their um, not social economic status, but um, like race and ethnicity, those that kind of data, right? But there is not only the issue of whether NIH is going to share the data with us to analyze, but it's also there's an issue of from the applicants in terms of protecting their privacy, right? So a lot of times we turn into institutional methods for the purpose of getting large scale data without the bothering a lot of getting to work with NIH, right? But also it's a way, to me, it's a way of protecting the privacy of those people being studied. So it's always this, and I think we need to find a balance between getting the social demographic data for the subjects of our study, but also, met, I mean, anonymize or protecting their provide privacy. So there's a lot of things going on. But to your point, yeah, I 100% agree. We wish we had more data. We wish we had a, this kind of data, that kind of data going up to their ancestors, right? Uh, but there's no way that we can get this data. We can only uh, do our best based on what we can have. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your thoughts. We have some more minutes for questions.
or discussion among I guess one one question quick question that I had is like how you find uh, funding for these things I know that the uh, Coleridge initiative uh, it's it's it, I think it's part of New York University so how how do you fund uh, how do you well, convince funders to help you with getting data you should have asked this question to Julia actually and uh, you know she has uh, this is a great study that they're still doing and uh, they identify data sources mentioned in the publications because there are no standards uh, about how to cite data uh, in publications right people mention the data sources in the paper but uh, you know they won't appear in the references so and the agencies especially statistical uh federal statistical agencies are very interested in understanding the usage of the data that they're producing because you know it's a lot of investment so they want to know uh who are the researchers that uh use the data what are the publications that you know the, uh, that these um data sources are mentioned so Julia has taken that uh, effort and, you know, it's it's a great initiative, worked with several agencies and uh, they actually developed some algorithms. So there was a Kaggle competition where researchers, some of the data scientists and computer scientists developed some algorithms to uh, capture mentions of data sets um, in, the, in the Elsevier uh, database uh, to actually tell, go back to the agencies and tell them, um, you know, here, here is what we find. And they actually work with the agencies because the agencies are saying this is true positive, false positive, and whatnot. So they actually collaborate with these agencies about their data sets that, you know, about the data sets that they're producing. And uh, coming back to the funding, so I was all, I was mentioning uh, to Julia, uh, oh, I would like to do something similar to uh, this for open source software. You know, I think that would be also interesting because people also do not cite uh, software and you know even if they want to they do not know how to cite software unfortunately I mean there are some initiatives there are some efforts right now but it's not common yet right and then <laughs> Julia was like oh my god it took me five years Gizem, to you know to bring together all these people and so much funding to raise from foundations from uh, agencies and whatnot so um, you know it's everyone when you when you talk about these things everyone says oh this is very interesting it's very important but when it's about funding <laughs> you know it's it, it becomes a challenge to raise funds for these efforts because it's very expensive right like you have effort from all these researchers and all the resources that are needed to be used but but for each context you know there were multiple foundations multiple agencies that actually um, chimed in to, to generate this because it also requires interagency collaboration as well because people use data source from multiple agencies so you actually need them to collaborate as well so it's not it's not straightforward but Julia is you know she's great so she has managed to pull that together Elena, you want to say something? I guess there is some discussion on incentives. I don't know if Carolyn uh, <laughs> wants to chime in, but, uh, but maybe we need more incentives. Uh, funding. I think NIH now has some sort of incentive that you are forced to put the data in an open, in you know, some repository for some of the data you produce. But maybe that's not enough. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think there's incentives that are like you just force people to do it. I don't think of that as an incentive. I think of that as like a regulation. Uh, and I find that like less appealing in the sense that like people then are always going to look for the shortcuts. To me, like a better solution, it's, it's like the same reason that like regulating financial institutions is hard. It's like you're you're making them do something they don't want to do and they're they're really smart and they're going to find loopholes. And to me, what feels like if you can do it is better is to like actually fundamentally change the game so that everyone's incentives are aligned. And so like in this case, how do we like rather than like forcing people to disclose their data, in which case they'll like disclose the bare minimum, how do we make it just like incentive compatible so that they want to do it? And so, you know, like a certain like I, I don't really have any great ideas, but like so why do people not want to do it? They don't want the scrutiny to their work, or maybe like they're still using this data for follow on projects and they'd rather like other people not have access to it too. But if there was like, you know, like one idea I've been like kicking around is like, 
what if you could like, instead of just like having citations be a binary yes or no thing, you have like a fixed budget of citations and you're supposed to allocate them to the, like in sort of that budget according to like how important the work is. So if somebody posts data that you actually use, you don't just cite them, you give them like a huge slice of your citation budget because like you truly could not have done this work had they not provided that data. And then those people are getting a lot of credit for having done that. So then maybe now data sharing is like more in the interest and like not only just data sharing the data you used, maybe you attach an extra variable that you think will make this useful for other people too, because you foresee that like being quite beneficial to you. But just like trying to think beyond like how do we regulate people into doing something they don't want to do and rather like make the incentives be so that people of their own volition will do it the way we want them to do it. I mean, I put that also in the chat. So if the tenure system, right, took that into consideration, in addition to publication, they actually exactly. look at the data sets that people are putting out there. And it's not only putting out data, it's also putting out data that pe other people use. That's the important piece, right? Because reusability yes. is a huge topic for, especially for data. You know, you can share data, but uh, you know, if you don't have the metadata, if you don't have the variables defined properly, and uh, if you do not ensure that they, the users can actually benefit from it, then, you know, this, it's also not very valuable. So you need to really measure the impact of these things, like how many people are using, actually using the data. And these should be taken into account when people are co being considered for tenure, being considered for promotions. I think it should come from the organization, the, the whole system uh, needs to be <laughs> changed a bit, I think, to make it more incentive compatible. Okay, so I think we are right on time to start the the the, uh, the mentorship session. So uh, I want to thank uh, Sarah, Carolyn, uh, Gizem, and Chao Chun for joining us today. It was an awesome discussion. Thank you so much, uh, and we hope to uh, that this was uh, helpful to make you think about all these issues of. of um, of biases that the data might have. And again, I want to advertise tomorrow's presentation by Roberta and Julia's presentation on Thursday about these issues as well. So let's thank the panelists and uh, I'm gonna stop the recording and